I couldn't grasp algebra, geometry, conjugate verbs, or any of that stuff in school. You know, I learned later that you know today if they had labels, you know, other than I was the kid that didn't work to my potential, I have that label a lot. I have that from second grade on, I think. But what I am is I'm a kinesthetic learner. Those educators in the room. I'm a kinesthetic, I'm a hands-on learner, I've been tested by the military. I'm like as high in the charts as kinesthetic learner as it can be. You put me in a classroom with audio, la la la, I'm listening to the clash. I mean, it, it's nobody's it's not playing anywhere, it's playing in my head. I'm not hearing you. You show me one of these things, a Prezi, same thing. I'm thinking about you know, the horrible thing my wife said to me last week. I, I'm not thinking about that thing. I, I'm gone. I'm, I, I used to be the kid sitting in the classroom, in my mind, driving my stingray over little jumps, and they call in the room, and, you know, what's the cloud? You know, who's the queen Elizabeth? Oh, and everybody laughed. I was that kid. So, how does a guy like that do anything, let alone succeed? Because, you know, your career fields for a kinesthetic learner are pretty much, I'm just generalizing, but generally, Construction worker or cook. <laughs> That's about the two. Not a lot of opportunities there. So what also we've just learned about me is I don't like school. I'm not good at school. <clears throat> but I do have goals. I have goals like everybody else here. I had goals as a kid. I wanted to be a good kid. I really did. I wanted to be a good adult. I wanted to have be married, have kids, have a nice car, have a nice education. I really, truly did. Um, so along with my challenges, then society's challenges came in, with, and my genetic challenges came in, and of course, I started doing those things, uh, you know, the heyday in the 70s and 80s in the kitchen when you work the line, the rush of the line. Um, many people, most people, in my day, almost all, if not all, on 99.9, .9, would work really hard all night, rock and roll, and then they'd party all night, right? So I got in that groove. And I started you know, using drugs and alcohol, and I was a really good cook, and I was really good dope feed for a while. Mm -hmm. And then 1988, things cleared up, reached the bottom on that, just cleaned up. And that's when this really project started. When you took all, all, all my fun out of my life, running around all night till dawn, um, it left a lot of open hours. And with those open hours, I realized, now being divorced at that time, having to pay child support for the first time, and really looking back at that goal list going, holy moly, I'm not achieving any of these goals that I really want to do in life. What am I going to do about it? And I didn't know I was a kinesthetic learner. I just thought I was a screw-up. So somebody suggested a food and beverage. Everybody needs a mentor or mentors in their life. I certainly have had them. I still have them. Uh, an F&B manager, I remember him telling me, he was wearing Armani suits back in the day. And this was like 1989, 90. He says, uh, this is an Armani suit, and you won't believe it, Michelle. I made 50000 a year. And I remember going, oh my god. <laughs> I only made fifty grand. Man, I could have the greatest girlfriend. And, and all this stuff that I was thinking. I, I could, I, I'd be all sad. And I said, well, Mick, but how do I do that? And it's Mick Finnick. I think he works for the city of Prescott now. Uh, but it was at the Marriott Mesa, Sheriff Mesa, Radisson. You know, I work at these places that don't do so well. That's why they have them. Um, so they have a bunch of different names over their tenure. Uh, so Mick said, you need to get some education. You need to get some initials after your name. You need to get certified. He was the first person that really told me that you have to gauge it. You don't have any school. You need to get certified. I said, how do you do that? And he said, go to American Hotel Motel, we'll pay for the classes. You, you pass a few of them and you can maybe challenge the food and beverage director's test. So the first certification I have, which is a lifelong certification, and for me, is there any of them in the room? <coughs> the easiest one <coughs> was my boss's certification, certified food and beverage executive. Took a couple classes, challenged the test, case study test. It was challenging. Got it. Now I started something, like I achieved something. So I was a member of the ACF. They said, well, you need to be certified as a chef. So I looked at certified working chef, which doesn't exist today. But what it, how certification worked back then was a big packet. You had this log book thing, huge, this thing. And every page was things like tallow work, 
ice carving, meat bath, on and on and on. And you would take that to your executive chef or your food beverage director, your general manager, and they'd have to fill in one to five on hundreds of categories, hundreds. And mine was legit, and I became a certified working chef. So then I got, wait a minute, I, I started getting addicted to this M-O-U-S-E after my name, you know? <laughs> Initials that people don't know, but it looks really good. Some of you have to get a bigger coat and start dropping around. So I got a certified working chef. So as things progressed, um, you know, I started getting more of the modern things. So certified executive chef, I had to take a, a test. <laughs> Scratch, you hear the car crash? <laughs> certified executive chef. And the list of books was this thick. It's still out there. If you go to the website, it's this thick. So I bought them all, looked at them, <laughs> went to the back to some of the chapters, which I still suggest. Don't try to go back to culinary school if you never went, because you're not going to sit two years and look at these books like I did for 10 seconds. Go to the chapter test. Start knocking out what you can't. Take notes of the ones you don't know. Study what you don't know. Why study what you know? This is Brian Gregos way, right? Because <laughs> if there's one thing I do, is I work the angles. You've heard, if you heard me present, I bring it up. Somebody put me down once telling me that. It actually is not a put down. I am good at working the angles. If anybody in this room can work an angle, I can work an angle. So I went and challenged, uh, I, you know, no class, no culinary school. I went to the CEC test. CEC is kind of high, right? Second highest in the world. I'm sitting in a, a testing facility. Reminded me kind of jail. <laughs> like when they first bring in, not that any of you'd ever been there, not that I'd ever been there. <laughs> but I sit at this thing and there's a computer and these questions pop up and it's simple, multiple choice. And I still remember today, the first one that came up was said, uh, the minimum butterfat content of ice cream is, and then four numbers. Seriously? <laughs> he might know that. The other pastry gal might know that. You think me, you know, as an executive chef in hotels, any matter of fact, you know how I would buy ice cream? I like that one, it's a good one. <laughs> that's it. That's thoroughly how I've ever bought ice cream. That's darn near how I buy everything. First one was that. Next one was what is the minimum water activity necessary for bacterial growth? I almost had to call the suicide hotline. <laughs> <laughs> it's only two questions in. And I now I, I'm in Chandler at the airport in this little thing, and I feel the bead, big bead of sweat just pouring out. And of course, I always change colors with my moods, and I'm sure it's purple. With these big sweats. And my health, chest was doing this, and I'm like, I, I'm not going to make this. And I don't really, really remember what the next one was, but then I hit, what is the caloric content of alcohol? <laughs> I knew what that was. <laughs> so all of a sudden I hit a whole bunch of like, you know, cuts of the beef and mother sauces and ding, 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 ding. And some more would come up. But, um, you know, at the end, the thing pops up. I don't know. The guy comes from the other room. All right, so. And he goes, well, you got 71.5. He's like, what's crap? He goes, you passed. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, it's 70%. Wow. And I went, oh, CC. Because <laughs> you didn't have to take a practical back then. So, you know, between us, when I share things too, promise you don't pass. I never said this. Use what I told you that's good and throw away anything else. I think Amy kind of said that about her chefs that, that sucked this morning. Um, so when I took my educators one, you know, a unique cool thing about me, don't tell too many people, don't tell anybody really smart with the ACF, but I have a certified executive, uh, certified culinary educators degree too, a certification. Does anybody sound that sounds kind of fishy from what I've already shared? <laughs> Did you hear bachelor's degree ever in my school? No. Any kind of education? If you look at my bio, it says, uh, Hospitality Management, Scottsdale Community College. It doesn't say degree. <laughs> <laughs> I did enter it once, but that, that's another long story. But so I got a CEC, and if I ever 
not continued my certification, I can never get a CEC again. And I'm pretty much 57. I'm saying <coughs> sure, I'm never going to get a CEC. Because now you have to have a bachelor's. When I got it, they, you didn't have to have a bachelor's. You had to have a thousand hours of classroom and all kinds of educational points. Well, one of my jobs in my bio was a culinary instructor for the military. One thing the military teaches you is you save every piece of scratch paper certification you could ever get. You snatch and grab it and steal the guys next to you and put it in your folder. And I did that. And somehow I have a military supply school, a school, humongous amount of CEUs, they that qualified somewhere in the CEC back then working in the angles or the culinary educator site. But still had to take a written test. <laughs> theory X, theory Y, management concepts, teaching that, you know, kinesthetic, where do you think I learned a big word like that? <laughs> uh, because I knew there was stuff that certainly I'm going to have to buy the book and read some of this stuff. So for the C culinary educator certification, I studied, and I studied like crazy. And I took the online classes, I took everything I could because I knew this one is not me, executive chef experience is not gonna get me through this. And now that I studied and I went to the same testing facility, the same thing, I'm still pretty freaked out, but I sit down, I get the thing, and I start knocking, I didn't have that three questions that beat us wet, and I passed that 82.5 for the one that I was weakest at. But it also taught me the first thing, one thing that I can say in my working career and most <coughs> things in life, I try to learn from my lessons, good or bad. So I didn't want to go through another 71.5, so I really studied. So let's get to my thing, and I didn't print it up because I didn't know if 20 of these were gonna be here or 100 of these are gonna be here. But these are, uh, you notice I don't have a PowerPoint. Believe it or not, today I might be able to put one together, but I kind of refuse to. Um, so, some suggestions I'd make when you want to get the other job the other guy wants. And I haven't even took you down this path, but I've kind of made a career of that. Um, one time, and I've shared this in bits of this before, but one time, in 1992, I was at the Sheraton Mesa, Marriott, the blah, 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 whatever that thing was. I was getting a house built, I was qualified for a home, I had a new wife, uh, everything I thought was awesome, Went on vacation. If you're a chef, don't ever go on vacation. <laughs> because if you have any dirty laundry or if there's any weakness you have, your enemies will build a case against you because you're not there to defend yourself. This has happened multiple times in my career, but not the bad results of this one. So I went on vacation and I came back to all these charges of you did this and you did that and you did this and you did that. So I defended them one by one by one, but it really boiled down quickly to you make too much darn money, and the new general manager don't like you. So you gots to go. So I got whacked. Clean and sober, new wife, house being built, decent salary, no doubt. During this process, the underwriter called my house, or called the job, because I thought I could just get a job and cruise. And of course, one of the people that aren't too happy with me in the pantry said, oh, Brian Dragos? Oh, he got fired. He ain't working there no more and sent them completely to the moon. They stopped <coughs> the building on the house. They freaked out. I have to find a job. When I cleaned up from drugs and alcohol, I made 195 as the sous chef at the, Sher uh, the embassy suites on the border rural and the freeway, Tempe. Within two years at the Sheraton Mesa Marriott Hotel Centennial, I was making 41.5. But I always put that out as an example. When you stop doing bad things and you really focus on the good things, how miracles can happen, because I've more than doubled my salary in less than two years. So it was the same guy, same work set, just focus. Didn't fall sick anymore, wasn't sweating blood, um, that's it. So I made the job. So I scrambled, at every, Arizona Central, this, 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 Gold Canyon needed a chef. Oh, Rob's had that job. From the front, it looked like a palace. From the back, it was literally a third world nation. <laughs> and it still is, if it still even exists. But it was horrifying, the back. But I needed a job, and I needed somewhere close to that range, or they weren't going to finish my house. And that crazy wife probably wasn't going to stick around if I didn't have the house for four kids that I was helping get back from the government and her ex-husband. So I mean, I looked at this as like do or die. 
So I pulled up my application, put it all on, but back in those days I put Ryan W. Drago, CC, CFBA, CCE, whatever. A couple days later I get this phone call, got called, got the job. After I got hired, the general manager told me, you know how you got this job? And I said, why? And he goes, well, you got the callback only. We wanted to know what the hell all that crap was after your name. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to goodness, that's a true story. That I got a callback from a job just because they wanted to know what the, all those initials were after my name. And then I interviewed well, and of course, I got the job. Got my house, got this, divorced the lady. So, <laughs> so, so if you're going to look for a job, you sure you want that job? Is this an emergency? Like I just said. Or is it some are you going somewhere? Are they worth you? Today I look at are they worth me? Not anymore. 911, I need a job, how much is it? Is it the job I want? Is it the right job? Second thing I got found, be prepared more than the other guy. Learn about the business, the internet. Technology today does wonderful things for you. Who is that FMB that's hiring you? Oh, he's known as behind the scenes, the chef killer? I worked for that guy before. Paul Hussey worked for that guy, but I already had the job and I didn't check the internet. There's, there's a guy in town and he's better now, we've made amends. But he had a reputation of going to town, going into jobs, where an established good name chef was making a decent buck, torturing him and whacking him, and hiring his own little line cook guys. And making him look all the money I say. Not caring about the chef and his family, whatever. So find out, is that guy the chef killer? Have they been through six chefs in the last eight months? And why? That's what I suggest. Who worked there last? When you networked, how was it when you worked there, Rob? Oh, it was horrible, man, when electric, electric, if it stormed, all the electricity went out and you still had to keep cooking. <laughs> or the ceiling leaked like crazy, or there's rattlesnakes on the way into driving, walking into, your, into the office. Um, call previous employers, you know, but you gotta filter, the, you know, employees, you gotta filter that. Most people that used to work there, used to work there because they didn't like it there or they didn't like them there. They're probably not gonna say the other things. I'm gonna give you my secret number one. Some people in the room will disagree with this. I've had many people disagree with this, but the things I present have worked for me. So just for me, I can guarantee you for me, this works every single time when I want it to work. If I'm going to a Radisson, a three to four star hotel, not a five star hotel, not a food beverage director's job, not a corporate chef job, but if I'm going to a Radisson, Sheraton, airport, kind of place, don't wear a suit. What? You always wear a suit. No. Present in their mind. People have a picture of what they're looking to hire. When you're hiring a chef and you've had a bunch of dinglings, in our trade, is there a bunch of wannabes and fakers? You all know that, right? There is. Thanks, guys, I came with it. <laughs> So what you want to present is a clean coat, check pants or black pants, workable shoes, clean haircut, you know, make, light makeup if you're a woman. But you want to, they're having a vision. They have a vision, the perfect chef. They're looking for the perfect chef. If you walk with them during the evening, <laughs> what do chefs do? How do they walk? Fast. <laughs> chefs walk fast. I got another job on how I walked. And I don't walk like that anymore, so God darn it, I hope I don't need that job. <laughs> so for a chef job, so if you're younger and you're looking to move from a sous chef to an you know, Indian don't care about a mid-tier, and believe me, I lived in that range for a long time, that's my success. Nice clean chef coat, presentable. Be that person that they can imagine that they go in the kitchen with a problem with, and you're going to be the guy that fixes it. I tried to start a consulting company one time and, I, and it was called, titled Let Chef Fix It because you know what? Um, you don't know how many times in my career I walked out the other doors and not kept walking and stayed right there and heard what they were saying about me when I went out. And I remember it could be food costs, it could be guest satisfaction scores, it could be whatever. 
But you don't know how many times in my career I've heard, let check fix it. We fix this, we're a solution. We're not all going to be the big leagues. We're not. We're not all going to be Emerald. We're not. But you can each have a pretty good career doing what I've done. And especially if you're anywhere like me with kinesthetic learner and that kind of stuff. ADE, ADHD, all those things that people call it. There's a great niche still for the people like me in this industry. Look at the Sheraton Four Points, look at the Rag, look how many of those there are compared to a Phoenician. And the next part of the show is, is a guy like me can get to that Phoenician kind of level. So, Draco Secret number one, present what you think they think they're going to want in their mind. Not what you've been told, not what you told in school, but what, now if I went for a food and beverage director's job, I'm wearing a suit. If I'm going to a corporate chef job, Am I going to do a mystery basket? I'm wearing a coat and an apron. If I'm going to an interview, I'm wearing a suit. I'm still going to be safe. When I went to my final thing in Solon, Ohio, I had a suit in the bag and I had a chef coat in my bag. I had both. Anybody get questions or disagreements on that? I know it's freaky to some of you. This is my story. <laughs> and believe me, I believe my own stories. When I sell, I always sell them at least a teeny tiny bit of truth. <laughs> Today I sell pretty good. I'm going to my ninth year as a corporate chef for Nestle Corporation, the world's largest food service company. Um, the two interview questions that kill and how to be prepared. Anybody that knows anything, and there's teachers and educators in this room, and there's really people much smarter than me. Probably 56 of you. Almost every one of you. Um, but the two questions that, that you heard about, you've heard about, are what's your strongest point? How many are chefs in this room? Y'all know that answer, right? If a chef with a ego as big as us don't know our strongest points, we ain't a chef. So we all know that one. But think of a couple very good, without egocentric, but you know, I served 2,000 people and I did it at 22% food cost, and the chef broke his leg that day. You know that. We all have one of those. Have two of those. But now, think about this one. And this is the one that I've got down, and this one's honest, and this one's good. The next one they're going to throw at you today, and almost every major view, if you get deep enough, is going to hit you with this one. What's your worst points, or what's your biggest failure? Has everybody got that in your head? Ready to fire that off in an interview? You do? Everybody? No. Mine? You want to hear them? They're ugly. Okay, my absolute worst. I was working at the Radisson Airport. I, used to, I still call it Radisson South Bank because I don't want to be a chef at an airport property. This other name was South Bank. And I was there almost seven years off and on different roles. But I was not only the chef there, but I was a regional chef, so I would troubleshoot throughout the United States for a 112 hotel chain property called Cervica. So I was called to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to work in an ancient property. And the banquet kitchen was upstairs and was all electric and literally built in the 40s. Electric steamer, stuff I've never seen. This stuff was like steam train days. So to even heat up this kitchen took at least an hour or two just to get stuff up and on. So I knew that. But I had a big event, a wedding um, on a Friday night. So I did a bunch of stuff. And believe me, if they fired the chef and I went into one of these, it was you lived on property. They knew I didn't drink. They knew I smoked cigarettes. And that they didn't give me a car. I was, they were pretty safe. So they would get me in a place and I was stuck. So I'd eat good steaks and smoke tons of Salem's, and that's about it, and maybe flirt with a couple girls. But that was the least thing they knew I'd be safe. So Friday night, Saturday night, I got the sweating for 200 people, and the menu I didn't create, right up there, just fixing it, or holding down the fort. And it was a stuffed game hen with wild rice that came pre-prepared, probably from later after a while with Tyson or something, right? So I look at the box, and I follow the instructions. So I go in, I fire up the kitchen, 
put these things in. They never cook. They're just like all day long. So finally, I'm using my fingers. Oh, they're done. So I serve raw gay hens oh. where the bloody, the wing joints were bloody to 200 people. It's horrible. They all start coming back and it was that wave of terror of, I don't have any more. <laughs> I haven't cursed yet either today, have I? Pretty darn close that one. Because uh, <laughs> I've been priding myself on that lately. Um, not not cursing, but not cursing in the presentation. Um, um, so they all took do, do I have more game hens? Heck no. I'm scrambling. All I got is chicken tenders and french fries to put out. So I got the call from the corp. And, 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 and probably the first time in my culinary career, I just they said, what happened, chef? And I think they were looking for, they never expected the regional chef of the year three out of four times to serve raw game hens. And I just said, I guess I wasn't familiar with the equipment, and, and I, I served them raw, and there's nothing I can do. I, I cooked them longer, but it was too late. I didn't give them the And I promise you, I'll never do it again. And believe me, I fixed that. Because chefs, chefs can be a handful too, right? You know how many times, and that was, Oh my gosh, let's figure this out. So that was probably 94. You know how many times I've served game hens since then? So that's 20 years. Is that 20 or 30? 20. 20. 20 years, zero. When will I ever make you game hens? Zero. Never again. Don't touch game hen, don't eat game hen. I won't. And I'm not lying there either. People that know me, Dylan used to work with me. We I think that her as a culinary competitor is soon. When will I ever? If somebody, if an owner says, I'd say I'm allergic to them and I will die. <laughs> I will lie to a whole of my show. There you go. I will. So that's one. My other one is not as dramatic, but it, it was just as bad. I sold my home to a family member. Made good money. Did all myself. I worked the angles. Did copies off the internet and said just copies. And I used it and I'll pass through the title. I didn't pay any commission. I sold it all, made good money. Part of the deal I said, oh, but, but you guys are getting married. I'll come to your wedding in Hawaii. Well, I also, if you know Brian Drago, says I don't do catering. I don't love equipment. I hate it. I guess it. Same thing. Do I ever do it? Absolutely not. When's the last time I did it? This time. When will I do it again? Probably the next time. Never. Same as the game ends. So I bought. Supplies in Arizona, put them in ice chests, they gave me the number of the people, we wrote the menu, I dragged all the stuff in my truck to Blythe, Arizona, stayed overnight in a hotel, kept ice with stuff, went to a person's house, had a barbecue grill in their home oven. 200 people. It's 200 keeps coming. I might not serve 200 ever again, now that I'm thinking of this. Grilled vegetables, it was a nice menu. Nice menu. I'm on sale. Cheap. Wife's helping me, the kids are little, they're helping me. I'll dial. Everything going. Get random food down this hill. Come up on the house. And all of a sudden, my wife's like, how much more of this you got? How much more of that you got? And I'm like, oh, why? She's like, it doesn't seem like these lines ever end and the food's running out. You want me to go get some fried chicken and say, you know, as those who don't know, my wife's from Mexico, so she, and back then she had a little accent. I'm like, no, absolutely. Are you crazy? And I said, how is this possible? And then I looked down, and I saw this charger plate. If you made that round about this big, they were serving food to off, off this buffet. Literally chargers this big. Never saw the chargers, didn't care. I'm the chef. I don't worry about service wear. I never looked at what if, what are they what are they serving my food on? Nice Seventh Day Adventist group. They eat like what Baptist Church does now, on a plate this big. I knew right there, Safeway, go! <laughs> so it was, whatever, chopped up this, the Safeway chicken, that at the end, and nobody gave me hell, but it was just even that one in front of my wife and my little children. <laughs> so those, but believe me, if somebody asked me, do I have them down? Do you believe? Did they sound like believable stories? They're the truth. So if I would interview with somebody, and, and, and what would be the solution there? Because you always wonder when you throw out the bad thing, but here's what I would do about it today. 
I always check the plates. What plate are you using? What plate are you using? That, that's the solution to that one. What plate? No way! <laughs> and tell them right there at the start. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't bake food for four months. <laughs> so, that's Drago's secret number two. Stack the deck, practice in front of a mirror. Practice both those stories in front of a mirror. I didn't practice this in front of me, but I've stolen versions of these stories. Those who know me, a lot. Don't make promises you can't keep. Somebody else taught me this one. So you're chef, you're in the interview. Food costs, labor costs, guest satisfaction, sanitation scores, oh, anything else. Add it to the list of things that go wrong. I'll fix it all. My first chef job, I think I was 22 years old. I'll fix it all. Yeah, and I'll be, I'll run myself ragged and insane and walk out on you as I do that and be mean and grouchy. Promise them two or three things, deliver those two or three, then be a hero and go back and say, okay, everything, you know, we're up to snuff and what more things you got. Make sense? Everybody can do that. Degrees, education, certification, I think we covered that at the beginning. Dirty words to a chef. There is some rare people. I mean, I, I remember years ago meeting a gal that wrote a very famous cookbook um, that was an attorney first that became a chef. That person's probably more crazy than me. Because I don't know if I was an attorney, if I'd want to go to like this. Or their entertaining suffering. Um, <laughs> work the career ladder. I think you all know there's a brigade system. There's uh, Amy mentioned it today, what how her husband worked through and how she worked through. I mentioned it today. What was my first job in food? Pantry boy. And I have literally worked the whole career trail. I was a pantry boy, then a lunch cook, then a broiler cook, then a saute cook, and on and on and on. And who else, what kind of, I kind of bash banquets. Who likes doing banquets? Three. If you don't like doing banquets and you go to a new job and you're good at doing banquets, don't ever tell them. <laughs> in the 80s through the 90s, somehow I didn't like uh, the glory. Is the glory job still the saute cook if you're in the line? In, in, I mean, that's the guy. I have to work six burners. Blah. In my day, that was, regardless of the money, if I could say, that was the cock of the walk of the whole restaurant business. I'm the saute cook. He might have a chance with the hostess. The pantry boy, <laughs> the pantry boy could only dream. <laughs> and believe me, when I was a pantry boy, I did. And when I was a sake cook, oh, no, no, I'm not going there today. But uh, I did that another time. Um, so, career ladder. Pantry boy, brother cook, sauté, sous chef, chef. I believe, as many chefs, old executive chefs believe, the largest jump in the in the career field in the kitchen is from sous chef to chef. Because normally, nobody teaches you. And, no, and, the, and the biggest gap there, the hugest thing is, is you go from still taking direction to only giving direction. How do you do that? that that's the weirdest thing you could ever kind of try to do. Because when you're the executive chef, unless you have a mentor on the phone, or a buddy on the phone that you can trust, you don't ask nobody questions, right? Real chefs in the room, been at it? When you're in the doo doo, we don't call it. Nobody where you work, because we know everything. Like they say, what's your, what's your, I had it today. What's your favorite thing? What, what do you cook? What's your specialty? My specialty is what my manager, what my guests want me to make, what the pretty girl I want to date wants, wants for dinner. What, what, what I'm in the mood for, that's my specialty today. As an executive chef, I don't have a specialty. Um, at Ocotillo Golf, where I work with Jill, I remember she's the funniest thing that we ever ran into. I was, uh, so the restaurant now suddenly has my name on it, so I'm thinking, oh, everybody loves it. And it's true, everybody loves the food we're making. We're making the guy tons of money, because that's why I put my name on it. That's clearly what he said. I got my first little Harley. I mean, I'm happy, I'm not, Totally crazy egotistical, but I put out great food with a great staff, best staff I've ever had before and since. 
So I'm doing things, cool things like Hawaiian fish fiesta. Three wild fish from Hawaii with three different garnishes, and it's beautiful. And I'm doing southwestern, the, the place is called Okakia. Okakia Golf is a southwestern cactus. But I'm suddenly told I can't do anything ethnic. I can't do anything wild game. And I can't do anything ethnic, wild game, spicy. Or when I was on vacation that time, he's going to chop, 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 chop my neck off, right, Dale? You're the one that told me behind his back. <laughs> That's the owner to my staff behind my back. If he does another one of these things, I'm going to chop, 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 neck off. So, so what is my, you know, what is my, what am I going to, you know, is whatever they want, what they're going to pay me for. I mean, in my family, my kids aren't here, my wife isn't here, I asked her to come, but she's not even one today. Um, Mike, I'm sure you back there, my new friend, if you ask my kid, a culinary student, or any of my kids on a given day, what does your daddy cook? <laughs> Frozen stoper is crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. Well, you know, today, I, I, it doesn't bother me today. Because the little bit of the story I've told you is true. And I've gone from that 1905 guy that's strung out and life's falling apart to nobody's recording right now. Is that live? Right. <laughs> to what they call an SLE HC, highly compensated exec. Um, I make very good money. I have too many kids. Didn't take care of myself when I was young, so I'm not rich, I'm not this and that, but uh, you know, Leonard Rubin will be here later, he's a very famous chef, I'm probably in the same range he is. I remember when I was talking to a couple of chefs at the Phoenician ago, and when you put my bonus and my package in, I was on the same level of playing field as him. Not bad for a guy that has no degrees, no experience, and works animals. Um, should I stay or should I go? I didn't, this is not getting a job, but this is in the process of getting a job. I thoroughly believe this statement, and this isn't, I think, a culinary statement, but the devil you know is always better than the devil you don't know. When I was at Ocotillo, I had a good quality of life. I would work nearby. I could work splits. I could go home in the afternoon. I could take the kids to some, uh, swim lessons. I could come back. I didn't kill myself. I worked hard, but I didn't kill myself. So I got mad at Bernie. I got sick of not being able to do my stuff. And in my hometown, there's the, Sher the San Marcos Hotel, historical hotel that I've worked a couple times. It just never does. It's always a mess. It's a dirty mess. Um, and I had it in my head that I'm going to do the same thing I've done for all these other places. Is I'm going to I'm going to be the one. This is going to be it. I'm going to turn the San Marcos around. And during the interview, they told me. Equipment still stinks. Um, you don't have any good cooks. You got this Middle Eastern food and beverage director that doesn't like chefs. But you got a great banquet chef and you got a great executive sous chef. And when I thought, still in my head, I'm going to turn this around, was how many times have I had a great banquet chef or an executive chef? Never, never, one or both, ever going in. So what the heck? cares about all the rest of the crap. I'll delegate to them and I'll do my deal. So I get in there within the first couple weeks, guess who quits? Executive <laughs> <laughs> sous chef comes to me within the first week and says, you know what, that little guy, he's lied to me, I hate him, I've got a new job, sorry chef, I'll leave you like this, I know you got a great reputation, you know, I, I look forward to working with you, but not here. Within six days later, the banker chef in the middle of November-ish, October-ish. So this job I'm going to turn around suddenly became a vegetable chopping job from before sunup till 10 o'clock at night. And smoking cigarettes in between and not eating and feeling grumpy at home and grumpy and everywhere and eating. And this little guy chased me around and finally going, hey, you're not at the F&D meeting. I'm like, are you going to do brunch then? <laughs> and cursing and finally yelling and throwing stuff at him. So <laughs> I can stand at Ocotillo with my name on it. I got a bigger heart in it. Still working with Jill. Probably still had her chop, 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 but it still worked my 50 kind of hours a week. But I chose to be the hero. But thank goodness there's always for me a silver lining. 
if I didn't leave Ocotillo and I didn't go to uh, San Marcos, I wouldn't have gotten a call from the ACF certification job bank from the US military that said, I don't know y'all, but I'm looking for a certified chef that wouldn't mind traveling around the world and, and uh, making a little bit of money, which taught me how to present. Monroe Dalton is a chef that I worked for there, relying on what Andy said today as a guy I couldn't really stand, but he was a great presenter. So today when I present, most of the stuff I take, the pauses I take, the truth, the little bit of humor I throw in, I all give to that guy that, that was a real pain in the butt. Um, keep it clean. So I always want to share, you know, I share some graphic things because my life has been pretty graphic. Uh, um, what's the Kitchen Confidential? What's, what's the one with Anthony Morgan? Huh? Kitchen Confidential? You know, why was that such a striking book when it came out? I don't think it was that striking. It just kind of told the truth for, for the first time. And really, if you look at that, and I didn't have the glorified uh, CIA background and work in Japan or wherever, but and, and probably never the quality cook he is, but the fun parts or the gory parts, you know, slide cocaine or crack cocaine into his heroin part, and, and I have Arizona Kitchen Confidential in my life. But I don't suggest that to anybody today. What I suggest today is, you know, what Amy kind of talked about at French Laundry. Come in, do your job. Um, you know, don't date people at your own job. Don't don't do drugs with people at your own job. Don't go out to drink after work with you know the people at your own. And I know that's a hard thing I'm saying, but you know, keep it clean at your job. You know, it. Uh, and I've certainly pulled plenty of shenanigans even today than not. But certainly when I was at Alcatel, I didn't date anybody at Alcatel. Why well, is that? Um, you know, does that make sense? You've all heard it. You all may have broken. I, I, I kind of even saw it going back. I keep going back to Amy this morning. You know, both work at meeting at the end, and they had a no fraternization policy. But I saw that twinkle in their eye, like. <laughs> 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 so remember, these are my thoughts and ideas. They may work for you, or they may not. But here's some facts, and these are. Please don't take that as me bragging. They're just parts of reality of. When you take your career and you focus on what, where you want to go, there's a goal. I want to be an executive chef. I want to make six figures. I want to be certified. I want to be respected in my career field. There's steps you take to get there. So in 1988, I was the sous chef at the Embassy Suites Tempe for $19,000. In 1990, I was the executive chef at the which is now known as the Marion Mesa. You know, I travel so much, I keep thinking I'm in a different state here today while I'm talking. I'm thinking of like Utah or something. It's so weird being in Shamrock like this. Um, and I made 41. Do <coughs> you think I cooked any different at the 19 or the 41? My focus was changing. Why? My focus is changing. 1997, Ocotillo. 50. Did I cook different at Ocotillo than the Sheriff Mason? No. I carried myself. That's, 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 I think there, that difference was, I was more confident in myself. As I stayed clean and sober longer, as I kept producing stuff and my numbers were better, I could look people in the eye and say, yeah, I kick ass. And you know what? You should give me that. Honor. And thank you. Um, 1999, I, I went to work for a brokerage. I always wanted to do something else. Chefs, the chef trade is not nice to your body. Look at any older chef. It's brutal. My dad was so beat up when he you know, passed on. And most of my mentor chefs, some of them are living struggles still kicking, but they're pretty beat up. Shoulders, knees, quarry tower floor is a killer. So as you progress and you get older in your career, I suggest always two things. There's two ways out, safely. <clears throat> Education or sales. Should I get in trouble today? Yes, yes. Should I get in trouble today? Yes. I'm tempted for you to get down. My opinion, education is good. But if you want to be more successful financially, the sales aspect is better. At least for me, it's Because I did education for the military, and that's where I'm in the 60s. But I knew I wasn't going to go anywhere. That was it. So if we were, if it was a military contract, that would be a 
2% times 10 years, okay, I can get a 20% raise if I last in 10 years. Sales, you can kind of put a little more cap on that. But from 60, 1999 to 2005, this is one I don't normally brag about. And sales people, Robert DeSantis is here still, right? Yeah. In 1999, I was working as a broker, sales broker, Monday through Friday, probably 20 hard days a year, who chose, hated them, but it was part of the deal you had to do, making good money, but I went back in the industry, <coughs> I had four tall floors, and everybody kind of had, is in the sales side, everybody has something to say. Um, I lost my mind, I was crazy, which all those of you know that about. Uh, and then later they added another piece to that, but, but right then he, he's lost it. He's completely, he's not going to make it, he's crazy, he's lost his mind. Why would he go back to Corey? He hates Corey Top floors. He's said he's done, he went back. Well, I was working for a broker, a previous employer, one of the Cervico guys, the best general manager I've ever worked for in my life, the meanest general manager I've ever worked for in my life, who I've become good friends with, I'm still friends with this today called me up and said, I've got the contract to open a really cool resort at Fort McDowell. I want you to be the pre-opening director of operations of the whole property, it's you. Laundry, rooms, bed sheets, custom china, banquet, equipment, ballroom, everything other than the carpet and the wall coverings is you. You get almost a year to sit in a trailer and I'm gonna pay you 85 grand. We said a couple cool, cool things other than the 85 grand, which was a really cool thing when you figured 60 to 85. Because I just made that, what, 10 years plus of raising at 2% in one job? But he said, custom China. As a chef, I'd always been a chef, but I'd never opened a property myself, a hotel. All of this was my dream. To be the guy when the cameras come in with all the equipment that I ordered, having people put them away, and have the menus that I did, and, the, and everything, and the, the, even the electrical outlets coming out of the ceiling where I put them. I don't care if you gave me the cake top or not, I would have been taken it off. I wanted to do what I've seen the other guys that I've been on teams for. I wanted to be that guy. In my mind, I would never have been an executive hotel chef to me, still kind of stuck in my head was, executive chef is a hotel chef that I wouldn't be that until I did that. And I remember giving tours. And when I would go to the ballroom, pretty much still the largest ballroom in the East Valley, east of, I don't know why, but it's huge. It's, we, we did sit down there in 2000 when I was still there. And I would be in the ballroom and I'd give tours pre-opening and I'd give tours and I'd go, this is my ballroom. And inside, every time I said that, I was scared out of my freaking wits. Because it was so big. It was like the Phoenix, it's almost to me, it's not as big, but it's uh, almost as big as one of the biggest ballrooms at Phoenix Convention Center. And I'm like, how am I gonna do this? It was one of the times in my career is I'm like, inside, outside, no problem. Inside, I'm like, holy cow. And I did it. Our opening with a green crew, never been together, new sous chef, hired from the ACF. Um, our junior member of the year one year, ACF. Never, not one person on my crew had worked for me before. Open it up, grand opening day, grand opening 24 hours was this. Sit down meal for 2,000 people, three courses, and the opening act was journey. The next day, property wide, reception with ice, Asian station, all through the whole property, outside, inside, everywhere, for 5,000. Next night, so the two, 24 hours ain't up. Tribal members and their VIPs, <coughs> tribal meal, three courses with Kenny Rogers. So first opening, opened a restaurant, did all this, I didn't even count restaurant numbers, who couple hundred. So nearly 10,000 people at different events with a green crew and no, no The end of that story, that chef killer that I talked about, he worked with me there. I helped hire him, I didn't know, I didn't do my research. So he, uh, when we did the opening trials in the restaurant, this is some of the shady stuff that can happen in our industry. I sat with him. 
weeks, have meetings. Here's how we're going to do the pre-opening, friends and family. We're going to set so many people in so much time, so we're not going to overwhelm the kitchen or the, or the front of the house. The very first day, we just blew it out. I worked the line, did 200 some covers, two hour wait, felt horrible, looked horrible. When I asked him, he's like, I don't know what happened. Well, I had two servers on his staff that used to work for me, Jillian's nephew and his girlfriend. And they said, that's not right, Chef. He told me I wanted to test the kitchen to see what they could do. That's when I heard from Paul Hussick that's here, or was helping here today lunch. Oh, I worked for him at the point, and after working there 16 years, that's the guy that fired me. And he's working with you. So I realized, right after opening, this Corey Tile Floors, Chef Killer, I gotta do something. I don't know, some people may not believe in a higher power or anything like that, but I was sitting at my desk, mad. The kitchen had gotten really quickly within the first month. Kitchen staff was all happy and fine. Amy mentioned it today, and I didn't do it that way for years, but nobody could come in the kitchen unless they asked me from the front of the house, back in the banquet area. If they wanted another Danish, they would have to come to me and ask me for one Danish. And they didn't want to. So they would sneak around the corner and go, oh, I got really mean again. Because I didn't like this guy. And I'm going to take it out on him and all his staff. So I'm sitting at my desk and I get, boom, AOL. Chef, Nestle Corporation, Las Vegas. Okay, click. Boom. Chef, Chef, ACF Jobbing. Chef, Nestle Corporation. sit here talking about that network. I got in the broker community. I quickly made a phone call. Who's the Nestle rep? Oh, Rick Green. I don't know Rick Green. Well, he, work, he, he works in conjunction with this guy. I'm like, ooh, I'm neutral with this guy. He's not my best friend. He's not my enemy. Mr. Corey. I used to run food sales marketing back in the day. So I called him Mr. Corey. Hey, this is Brian Drago. So I heard there's something with Nestle. Oh, yeah, I'll give you guys a number. I called up this guy who's now my friend and one of my mentors with the Nestle. And the conversation went like this. Hey, uh, Rick, this is Brian Drago, blah, 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 blah. I wonder how I really want this job. I know I can do it. I can take what? I broke experience, blah, blah, blah. How do I get this? I need you in my corner, blah, blah, blah. He goes, who's this? I go, it's your new chef. He goes, what? <laughs> he thought it was insane. But I, same thing. I told him, and he'll never forget. Who was it? I'm his new chef. And he stuck that in his head the whole time I interviewed for the next five months. Who is Dragos? He's my new chef. Well, now he introduces me as the greatest hire he's had in this. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. So uh, today, HC, I talked about that. So it works for so many, it works for me. This guy that came to Arizona, little stingray bike, dirt fields, pantry boy, two. Now, and uh, what was it? 2011, there, there were 16 Nestle chefs in the United States. It's all based on sales, sales numbers. Arizona is, believe it or not, considered a small market. Arizona and Vegas combined at the time is still considered a small market compared to Southern Cal, New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago. But in 2011, uh, Nestle uh, corporate sales chef of the whole United States was. So the hotel chain, chef of the year for 112 properties, Nestle for the 16 people. I think practicing what I preach and doing what I do today, I feel comfortable giving my little skill to you today. Any questions on getting the job the other guy wants? Because I think I'm good. I'm just about there. So please utilize what you think may make sense. Throw away what don't, like Amy said this morning. But no. Your point to where if you're an ACF member and on the website, being able to change the whole oh, thing. Let me fine tune those. Okay. Yeah, that's a couple a key point. things up front about jobs. And okay, this is put on the ACF Arizona chapter, which I'm president. <laughs> Why I believe certification is important, even if you have a degree or even if you're a chef, even if you're qualified, is Marriott Corporation, General Mills, Nestle, 
major manufacturers and corporations are either demanding ACF certification, excuse me, or using the verbiage of certifiable. But believe me, don't count on that. I have a friend who worked for the military who was getting certifiable for seven years until they told him so many times and they finally terminated him because he didn't have a certification. So, if you're an ACF member, there's also a job bank. And I've told you twice where they found me at the military and I, they, I found Ben Weiss's me with the Nestle game. Costs nothing. You're an ACF member, it's free. But how, but not a, I'm glad you, that stuck in your head. If you are a member and you are in the ACF job bank and you think you did it last year or the year before or five years ago and think it's done, don't count on that. You're at the very bottom of the list. Go in that thing, refresh it, put a dot behind, behind your name if that's all it is. When you update it, it goes to the top of the list. The military won, believe it or not, how he found me, literally, because I was bitter, I had gone in and I literally put, I noticed on my initial CEC dot, comma, I didn't have a dot behind one of my things. Like on my certification today, I don't have a comma with the AAC, I noticed after a printer. So certification for me, my last four jobs, were based on chef certification, but you can't count the rest one because he already knew what he had. He already knew I was certified chef. So four out of five jobs were mandated for chef certification. And um, that's my story today. I hope it was good. I feel good about it, so that usually tells me something. But uh, I did make a few laugh, but you know, that's my story. And it, it, is, it is what it is. So we'll take a little bathroom break, and I'm going to see where the next people are. So